again, or is it there? It's, yeah, so it takes a minute to shut off. Okay. Yeah. My name is Dina. I'm one of the librarians here at Cary Hill Public Library, so welcome to our library. Um, hello to all the people that I recognize from last night's event. This is the second event in our American Creed Community <coughs> Conversation series. So American Creed Community Conversations is a project that was started by the American Library Association in partnership with Citizen Film, the National Endowment for the Humanities, PBS, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the National Writers Project, I think that's everyone on that list. So American Creed is a documentary that was filmed for PBS. We screened it here last night um, about what it means to be an American, what it means to be an American citizen. Um, and in conjunction with that, uh, so we, last night we hosted a screening of the documentary and a discussion. Tonight we've partnered with the Network for Responsible Public Policy to bring in a guest speaker with us. And then at the end of the month, uh, on Monday the 29th, we'll be bringing back our humanities scholar, Dr. Chris Fisher, to conduct another um, discussion around the American Creed. Um, so just some housekeeping notes. It's a little warm in the room. We apologize. Uh, we are having some air conditioning issues, but we're working on that. If you're looking for our restrooms, they are out the door and to the right. Uh, you'll see a tapestry on the wall and go there. Uh, and this event was also um, sponsored by the Friends of the Cherry Hill Public Library. Um, our Friends organization is amazing and offers us so much financial support. And without them, we wouldn't be able to bring you all of the amazing things that we're able to bring you. So again, welcome to the Cherry Hill Public Library. And I'll introduce you to Janice from the Network for Responsible Public Policy. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Janice Rail, and I am the Network for Responsible Public Policy Coordinator for Programs in Camden County. I want to thank the Cherry Hill Public Library for partnering with us. Without their wonderful collaboration, this program would not be possible. For those of you not familiar with NFRPP, we are a nonpartisan volunteer network committed to providing the general public with credible, fact-based information on key public policy issues and concerns. We believe the best solutions to challenging issues are made possible by, peace, by people who have authoritative information and, will, and are willing to advocate for policies that serve us best. Please visit our website, nfrpp.org, for more information about us and to view videos of our past programs. All the videos are online. It's very nice. We welcome you to adding your name to our network and receiving notices of future programs. Tonight's topic is one of those challenging issues. We hope to learn a lot from our expert speaker, and we hope that you will engage them with your questions after the presentation. Let me introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Perry Dane is a professor of law at the Rutgers School of Law, Camden. He is a graduate of Yale College and Yale Law School. Professor Dane was previously on the faculty of the Yale Law School and served as law clerk to William J. Brennan, Jr., Associate Justice of the United States Supreme Court. His interest in research, his research and teaching interests include religion and the law, constitutional law, and legal pluralism. He is the secretary of the Council on Religion and Law and a frequent speaker on church-state questions. He is here tonight to present Religion, State, and the United States Constitution, the Law of Love, Peace, and Liberty. Please welcome Perry Dane. So thank you so much. Um, hello? Yeah, turn it. Turn it. Does that work? Hello. Yes, hello. There it is. That works a little too Hold well. Hold it down a little. Oh. Hold it down a little. Okay. How's that? Okay, uh, so I'm absolutely, absolutely delighted to be here, uh, and I'm especially delighted uh, to be at this program sponsored by the Network for Responsible Public Policy. It's actually my third talk uh, that they've sponsored, although my first solo one, uh, and and all three were three different topics. So if you want to know everything you need to know about the judicial selection process and how and how crazy and bizarre it's, it's become in the United States. That's a topic for another night. Um, <laughs> and if you want to know about gun control, that's that, that's that's also a topic for for another night. 
And I'm also especially delighted uh, that this program is being sponsored through the American Creed uh, program. Uh, that word creed obviously has several meanings. Uh, one of them is just any set of beliefs. But the word creed also has a distinctively religious overtone. And it seems to me that's not a coincidence. And it fits directly, I didn't plan this, but it fits directly into the theme of, of my talk tonight. Uh, so my topic is religion, state, and the United States Constitution, uh, the law of love, peace, and liberty. Uh, I bet you haven't heard the word love associated directly with, with, with the Constitution, <laughs> except in the context of same-sex marriage. Uh, and I'm going to end the talk by, uh, by spending just a few minutes on, on, on the same-sex marriage question. Uh, but you'll see pretty soon where this idea of, uh, of love, peace, and liberty comes from. So let me just start. So I generally don't like. No, you just, you, you were just, just too close. So, very good. Okay. Uh, so let me just um, start by giving you a bare bones outline of, of how the Constitution fits in, of how religion fits into the Constitution. Uh, and it fits in, in in a really quite, quite remarkable way. Um, so here's the First Amendment. Uh, the Constitution was adopted in 1787 uh, for all sorts of reasons. It did not include a Bill of Rights. In the ratification debates, there was a lot of upset about the fact that the Constitution did not include a list of rights that the federal government had to, had to respect. So one of the political promises that was made in, in, in the ratification process was that as soon as the first Congress got to work, they would propose a set of amendments to, to the Constitution, a set of amendments that we now know as the Bill of Rights. Uh, they proposed 12 amendments. Uh, 10 of them got ratified by 1789. Uh, one of the others actually just got ratified a few, a few years ago, 200 years later. Very, very strange. Uh, but it's those 10 amendments, it's those 10 amendments that have come to be known as the Bill of Rights. And the very first of the Bill of Rights, First of the Bill of Rights is obviously has some pride in place, uh, and it includes some of the some of the liberties and some of the constitutional protections that that we hold dear: freedom of speech, freedom of the press, uh, freedom of assembly. But at the very beginning, if you stand too close to that one, they, they interact. All right, so I can't stand close to anything. Okay, so. At the very beginning of the very first, you know what, I might just give up on this. Um, can I speak into this thing? Yeah. Uh, go to the video, John. They won't really hear it. Oh, they, okay. Then you know what, maybe I'll just use the podium then. I hate using the podium. Um, but it's better than having lots of feedback. Uh, so, so at the very beginning, very first amendment to the Constitution. Uh, at the very beginning of the first amendment, the first article of the Bill of Rights, are these two clauses about religion. Um, and you're going to see three clauses here. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, but these two clauses, these two clauses are typically called the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause. Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, for reasons not entirely relevant here, even though it says Congress, uh, the way this is understood now and the way it's been understood for much of the 20th century, was that the same, the same constitutional principles apply not just to the federal government, but, but to the states as well. Uh, so there's... Congress will make no law respecting the establishment of religion, that's one clause, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Uh, and I like to think that there are actually three clauses, <laughs> for what it's worth. Uh, there's the establishment clause, the free exercise clause, 
And then somewhere between the gaps, somewhere, somewhere between the cracks, is a third set of ideas uh, that has something to do with establishment, something to do with free exercise, something to do with our common law tradition. It's sort of mysterious, and it's not my topic tonight, but just for the sake of, of, uh, of completeness, I'm throwing it in. So what's the Establishment Clause about? Uh, the Establishment Clause deals with the structural relationship, the structural relationship between, between government and religion. Uh, the sorts of institutional interactions uh, that can occur and cannot occur between government and religion in, in the United States, uh, the sort of practices in which government itself can and or may not participate, uh, the sort of help it can give to religion, the sort of help that religion can give to the state. So it's these sorts of institutional structural relationships so, typical questions under the Establishment Clause. Um, a prayer in the schools, right? So, I imagine that there might, there might be some people here who grew up in, in public schools where there were prayers at, at the beginning of the day, yeah. right? That was declared unconstitutional in the early 60s, and I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, prayer in in legislative bodies, in state legislatures, in Congress, in city councils, that's actually constitutional, or at least the Supreme Court has said that's constitutional. So two similar practices, in some ways, two different constitutional results. Uh, the Establishment Clause also deals with other forms of religious expression by government. Uh, there was a case in 1984 uh, about a nativity scene uh, erected by the city of Pawtucket uh, in Rhode Island as part of their large Christmas display. Uh, and I know it's hard to believe, and I, I know it's incredibly hard to believe, but in 1986, uh, I was already teaching some of this stuff, and I wanted to get a first-hand look at this, at this nativity scene. Uh, so my, my then fiance and I, uh, she's now been my my wife for, for more than 30 years. Uh, but my then fiance and I went up, to, uh, went up to Pawtucket and we took a whole bunch of photos. I'm not gonna show you the whole photo album. <laughs> we took a whole bunch of photos of Santa and reindeer and, and the nativity scene. Uh, and I put myself in one of the photos uh, just so that for posterity we'd have a sense of scale. Right, so you can see behind, so, so that's me. And that's the part that's hard to believe. Right? That's, <laughs> right? that's, actually, that's actually me. Uh, and behind me, right, behind me are the shepherds and, uh, and Jesus and Mary and, and, uh, uh, and some animals and so on. Right? So, so it was the constitutionality of that, that structure that the Supreme Court decided in, um, in 1984. Uh, and then finally, the Establishment Clause also deals with questions of money. Uh, what are the limits on the, the, the sort of financial relationship that, that, that can exist between the government and religious schools, churches, religious institutions? All sorts of complicated questions. Uh, what's free exercise about? Free exercise is about individual, individual religious liberty. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the case of Mormon polygamy. There, there was a Mormon uh, a polygamous family up there in, in the, the upper left-hand corner. Um, actually, these days, the, 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 it's, the church of, it's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, that used to be called the Mormons, but they no longer want to be called the Mormons. So out of respect, I'm going I'm to try to, uh, uh, try to abide by that. So the Supreme Court ha had to decide whether members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints had a constitutional right uh, not to be bound by, by the laws that, with respect to everyone else, would, would ban bigamy or polygamy. Uh, they lost. Uh, in a case about 100 years later, uh, the Amish in Wisconsin actually prevailed in, in a case in which they claimed 
a free exercise right, a right of religious liberty, to keep their kids out of school after the eighth grade, which was essential to their form of religious community. Uh, there was a case of Native Americans. Uh, these are just some of the many, many examples of, of, of free exercise questions. Uh, there was a case of Native Americans uh, belonging to the Native American church whose central ritual, right, whose central ritual is the ingestion of, of peyote, uh, which is a controlled substance. And they also claimed a free exercise right. They also lost. It's a long, complicated story. Uh, some more recent free exercise types of issues. Right? This is one that has, uh, has not been much of a question in the United States, actually. Uh, because in, uh, in the United States, we've been quite good about respecting the right of people to, to wear religious garb. In many other countries, in many other countries, it's been a considerably more fraught question. And what's remarkable is that in some countries, uh, religious garb, like a hijab, is banned not despite the fact that it's religious, but because it's religious, right? So some countries, like France, uh, bear, uh, ban, at least in certain contexts, such as public schools, the wearing of distinctive religious garb. Right? So if you, if you can convince the school that you're wearing a headscarf as a fashion statement, it's okay, really. Uh, if, you, if, if it's a hijab that you're wearing for religious reasons, it's not okay. Uh, in the United States, a law like that would get thrown out in a millisecond. But ideas are different in some other places. Uh, Quebec is about to pass a similar law. So it's not just hijabs, it's yarmulkes. Uh, they, they, keep ask, uh, they, they, they keep asking, or people keep asking, what about crosses that, that people wear? And again, they make this sort of, right, they make this strange distinction. If you're wearing the cross as a piece of jewelry, it's okay. If you're wearing the cross as a marker of your religious identity, it's not okay. So how do you know the difference? Well, if it's less than an inch and a half, it's jewelry. If it's more than an inch and a half, well, okay. Again, a, a law like that would never, would never be allowed under our constitutional understanding of free exercise. Uh, you might also have heard about the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, right? Uh, which I'm not gonna talk about which I'm not gonna talk about, except to point out, it also raises questions of religious liberty, uh, although for technical reasons, not under the Constitution, uh, but it does raise questions of religious liberty that, and uh, it raises the, the important question when, uh, when one person's religious liberty conflicts with somebody else's uh, separate civil right to, to be served, uh, on an equal basis with other people, which, which of those should prevail. So that's free exercise. And then finally, the one that people think about less, religious institutional autonomy, uh, which is a whole set of questions about the internal governance of religious organizations. Uh, ch church property disputes, for example. Right? Uh, when a denomination splits, who gets the bank account? Who gets the buildings? And who gets to decide who gets the bank account and the buildings? Is it decided like any other property dispute or is it decided in some distinctive way? Uh, do sex discrimination laws apply to churches and other religious groups that don't ordain women? And if not, why not? Uh, and they don't apply. And it's not just simply a matter of free exercise, it's a matter of this self, this, this guarantee of self-governance. So those are the three big pieces, those are the three big pieces of, of the religion clauses. And it's worth emphasizing that our, that I, as, as I've already suggested, our understanding of some of these questions uh, is distinctively American. Uh, it's not better, it's not worse necessarily. I think in some respects it's better, in some respects it's just as good. Uh, but our, our understanding of these issues arises in many ways out of our distinctive American history.
distinctive American political history and, and, and religious history. Uh, and our demographics, right? The fact that we've never been a religious, e even from the beginning, we've never been a religiously homogeneous country the way some other places have been. Uh, so, and we've had very powerful thinkers, both religious thinkers and, and secular thinkers who've shaped our distinctive view. So I like to, so I like to call it the American experiment in, in religion and state, right? This is, this is our path. Sometimes we stumble, sometimes we get it right, but it's this distinctively American path. And I do like to emphasize to folks that um, there are other paths, right? So the English, right? The English have, an, have a real live established church. Right? It's not just what we call an establishment of religion, which is usually you know, a little prayer here or, or, or money there. Right? In England, they have a real live established church. Uh, it, the, the Church of England is the church by law established. Right? Capital C, capital L, capital E. Uh, the Queen of England is the head of the church. She's not a member of the clergy. She doesn't actually exercise power over the church, but she's the symbolic head of the church, just like she is the symbolic head of, of, of the nation. That is part of her official identity. Uh, bishops of the Anglican church, certain bishops sit automatically in the upper house of the, of, of the British parliament. Uh, and yet, and yet the, the English have a, an enormous amount of religious pluralism, religious diversity, religious liberty. Uh, and who do you suppose are the biggest defenders of the continuing status of the established church, of the Church of England as the, as the established church? It's not Anglicans. Right, the Anglicans tend to be a little ambivalent about the whole business. Uh, one of the most articulate defenders of the established status of the Church of England in recent years uh, has been Jonathan Sachs, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, Lord Rabbi Jonathan Sachs, uh, the former chief rabbi of the Commonwealth. And on another occasion, I might, I, I might tell you what his, his arguments are. Uh, but uh, for Rabbi Sachs, having established church doesn't interfere in any way with his ability to, to be Jewish. And in fact, he would argue, enhances it. And again, that's a topic for, 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 for another day. So, so far, I've told you all the things I'm not going to talk about. Right? Uh, so let me, let me tell you what, what, I'm trying to, what I want to do tonight. Uh, I want to focus in on one piece of this larger story of religion and state. And it's only one slice, it's only one angle. It's not the whole story, but it's one piece of it. And what I want to emphasize to you are a couple of related things. One is that this American experiment, this set of ideas we have about religious liberty and disestablishment, uh, this set of ideas is itself not exclusively, but at least in part, rooted in religious ideas, right? The establishment clause, I mean, it's sort of the great paradox. The, the, the establishment clause forbids us from establishing a religion. The establishment clause is a theological commitment as much as anything else. It grows out of a distinctive set of the theological ideas. Uh, our notions of free exercise have at least some of their roots in theological ideas. Not the whole story. I'm only telling you one, again, one slice of the story. You know, it's like doing an autopsy, right? And you're just sort of looking at one, you know, at one organ. It doesn't tell you the whole, the whole body. But it's the one that I want to focus on tonight. And then the second piece of this is that uh, much of the formation of these distinctively American ideas has come through the actual encounter with religious groups themselves, usually minority religious groups, sometimes real minority religious groups, 
and sometimes imaginary ones. In fact, the first story I'm going to tell you is about an encounter with, with what was then, for the people involved, a largely imaginary group, and yet it was important. So I'm going to tell you some stories. I'm going to tell you some stories. And uh, so rather than getting very theoretical, rather, rather than getting very abstract, I'm going to tell you some stories that illustrate these points. And the first story is the story of the, f do you mind if I take this up? Oops. Somebody's going to get very upset with me. Uh, can I put this in my pocket here? Hmm? Okay. That's better. Uh, so the first story, first story I want to tell goes back way before the Constitution, way before the Bill of Rights. It's the story of the Flushing Remonstrance. Has anyone here ever heard of the Flushing Remonstrance? It is an amazing document and an amazing part of our history. Um, and it took place in Flushing, Queens. Right? Now, most of us today are familiar with, uh, with Flushing, Queens as a thriving, busy uh, neighborhood in uh, in Queens, New York, not, not far from LaGuardia Airport. Uh, and it's where the Mets play, right? And some of us remember the New York World's Fair. Um, and so, this is, uh, the, so, so on the right is the, is, the, uh, is the World's Fair in the 60s. Uh, is, the, is, is there anyone here who remembers the Flushing World's Fair in, in the 30s? No, no, no. no. Okay, but a lot of us remember the one in the 60s, right? So that, that's how we think of Flushing today. Uh, and Flushing, Flushing uh, has always been in recent years an, uh, an ethnic neighborhood. My wife, who grew up in Long Island, remembers visiting friends in Flushing. Uh, and at the time, it was a very Jewish neighborhood. Uh, now it's a very Asian neighborhood. It's a remarkable wonderful place, uh, just absolutely, absolutely fascinating and just exciting to walk around. Uh, but in the 17th century, in the 17th century, Flushing was a little village. And it, wa and it was a village under the general authority of the Dutch colony of New Amsterdam. Right? So if you remember, before New York was New York, New York was New Amsterdam. It was a, it, 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 it was a Dutch colony. Um, it became English in a, in a essentially peaceful handover. Uh, 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 the, uh, the Dutch capitulated without many shots being fired. But in the mid 17th century, New Amsterdam was a Dutch colony. And, and what they called New, New Netherlands actually went all the way up the Hudson River. Uh, so they had, a major, they had a major presence in what we, now call, what we now call New York. And Flushing was a little village that was a sort of satellite, satellite settlement. Uh, the main settlement, as you know, was in Manhattan, right? But there was this little satellite settlement in Flushing. Uh, and the Flushing settlement was actually particularly interesting because there were Dutch there, uh, and it was, it was established under a charter from, uh, uh, from the Dutch East India Company. Uh, uh, so it was under Dutch jurisdiction. There were some, there were some Dutch there. But it also had a decent number of, uh, of English folks uh, who had settled there because they weren't happy in New England. Right? And in part, they weren't happy in New England because there was a little too much religious oppression. So they also settled in this little, this little village of, of Flushing. Um, the governor of New Amsterdam at the time was Peter Stuyvesant. Uh, now, New Amsterdam has this sort of interesting paradoxical history because, because on the one hand, a lot of people credit the very existence of New Amsterdam as being the seed of 
American ideas of religious liberty as well as American ideas of, uh, of capitalism, right? It, it, it was a very entrepreneurial place. Uh, the, there's a remarkable book about the history of, of New Amsterdam that, that suggests that the whole entrepreneurial spirit of the Dutch colonists was eventually taken over by the English. And the fact that New York is now the, the amazing city that it is traces itself back to that original inspiration. So, but the paradox, the paradox is that Peter Stuyvesant himself uh, was an incredibly intolerant person. Uh, and he hated all sorts of folks. So, so uh, when, when the first Jews settled in, uh, in, in, in New Amsterdam, uh, there were refugees uh, from, uh, and, hmm? Well, the exactly, right. So, so there were refugees from, from a Portuguese colony in Brazil. Uh, they wanted to settle in, uh, in New Amsterdam. Uh, and Peter Stuyvesant said no. Peter Stuyvesant said no. Uh, uh, we're full. Uh, <laughs> that's the only political comment I'm going to make to this. Right? You know, you know, he said no refugees, we're full. Um, he was overruled. He was overruled by his bosses back in, back in the Netherlands, which is why de there ended up being a thriving Jewish presence in uh, in New York. So he hated Jews. But there was one group that he hated even more than he hated Jews. Right? Even more than he hated Jews, and that was Quakers. Um, and it turned out that there was a group of Quakers that settled in Flushing. Um, uh, and they were welcomed in Flushing. And in fact, one of the most influential and important people in Flushing, a, a guy called by the name of John Barron, married a Quaker. Uh, his wife was Quaker. Uh, so there was a lot of easy, comfortable interaction between these Quaker settlers and the English and the Dutch, who had themselves settled in Flushing because they wanted a little more freedom than they would get in, in Manhattan. Uh, but Peter Stuyvesant was not happy. Uh, so that's the only other photo of myself I'm going to show tonight, and it's, and it's more recent. Uh, the Quaker Meeting House, the Quaker Meeting House, which is old and historic, was actually built after the events I'm going to tell you about, but not long after. So it also dates back to the 17th century, and it's probably the oldest existing house of worship in, in New York. Uh, John Bound's house uh, still exists. Uh, and again, it's either the oldest or the second oldest existing uh, residents left in the city of New York. Uh, everything in New York over the years got torn down. Uh, the Bound family, recognizing the historical importance of this house from the beginning, this is an absolutely amazing story, recognizing the historical importance of the house from the beginning, in, from one generation to the next, each generation would specify in its will that the house had to be preserved. Uh, the Bound family and their descendants eventually became very wealthy. Uh, this little house was not adequate for them. They built, <coughs> they built mansions. Uh, until the 1940s, they used the house to occupy whatever sort of widowed members widowed or unmarried women members of the family uh, didn't have the, another place to live. Uh, so, so, so they lived in this house until the 1940s when the last of them died out. Even then it was a, a tourist attraction. Uh, the one thing these women had to do in return for, uh, for free women board was, uh, was dress up in 17th century clothing. Uh, uh, and then it was turned over to, to a nonprofit organization. Uh, and I made a pilgrimage to the John Brown House just, just a couple of months ago, and, and it's, a, it's an amazing story. So, so Peter Stuyvesant wanted, wanted, the, uh, wanted the Quakers arrested, and the, 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 the leaders of Flushing, the leaders of Flushing wrote him a letter back, uh, and it's, it's known as the Flushing Remonstrance. 
for some reason that they don't quite understand, John Brown was not a signatory. He might have been out of town at the time, but he certainly was a supporter of, of that response. So, uh, oops. Hmm? Something here is not. Okay, you have been pleased to send to us a certain prohibition extend. Okay, I'll just summarize it. Um, <laughs> The response that these folks in Flushing sent back to Peter Stuyvesant um, the response to, to his to his demand that they that they hand over the Quakers for arrest. Oh, I their response was, "We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it because they're protected." by the law of love, peace, and liberty given to us by Jesus Christ uh, and guaranteed to us by, by the Dutch government and, and by the charter that we received. Um, and the line that for some reason isn't showing up, maybe it's divine intervention, <laughs> is they said that same law of love, peace, and liberty extends not just to Baptists and Quakers, but to Jews and Turks and Egyptians. Uh, they didn't really know any Jews, Turks, and Egyptians. They were the sort of placeholders for the most exotic people they could think about. But what they were saying was, um, they were in their imagination encountering not just familiar people, not just Quakers who had become familiar, uh, but the most exotic people they could think of. And they were saying that same law of love, peace, and liberty extends to them as well. So religious liberty was a principle of religion. It wasn't, it wasn't simply some sort of uh, secular uh, right that was imposed on, on religious people who, if, if they had their way, would just be burning everyone at the stake. Uh, for these folks, respecting the religious rights of the Quakers and respecting, and respecting the religious rights potentially of what to them were the most bizarre religions they could think of. You know, they hadn't heard of Buddhists and Hindus, so, you know, Jews and Muslims, that, you know, that was pretty bizarre for them. It was their God that demanded, and not just demanded, it was their God that warned them that if they did not respect the liberty of those people, they would burn. I mean, it, it's a very, very uh, clear and theologically powerful statement. Uh, and that's why the Flushing Remonstrance of, seven, of 1657 uh, is often uh, described as sort of the birth certificate of American religious liberty. And it was a theological document. OK, so move ahead to 1785. All right, move ahead to 1785 and move ahead to people that you are probably more familiar with, such as James Madison, All right? Uh, not quite as famous these days as Alexander Hamilton, uh, but, you know, but he's not, you know, he's not chopped liver. Uh, and uh, so in 1785, in 1785, Madison was a member of the Virginia, the Virginia legislature, the, the state of Virginia. Uh, so this is before the Constitution, before the Bill of Rights, but it's, it's well after independence. Virginia had had an established church. Like many of the colonies, it had had an established church. Uh, in fact, most of the colonies had established churches. Some of them continued un until the early 19th century. Uh, uh, most of New England was Congregationalist. Most of the South, as well as New York, was Anglican, 
officially Anglican. Doesn't doesn't mean that other people didn't live there, but that was the official religion of 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 the colony. Uh, Rhode Island never had an established church because it was it was created uh, by Roger Williams, who was a radical Baptist who also believed on religious grounds in religious liberty. Uh, Pennsylvania never had an established church because it was established by William Penn, who was a Quaker, who for religious reasons didn't believe in having an established church. Uh, New Jersey didn't have an established church. Uh, for somewhat less I, sort of fancy reasons, if you think the north-south split in New Jersey is new, it's not. <laughs> it goes, goes back to the very beginning. So in northern Jersey, they were influenced by New York. But in southern Jersey, we were influenced by Pennsylvania. So they could never decide what to do. So that's why New Jersey didn't have an established church. <laughs> anyway, Virginia had an established church. It, it was the Anglican church. Um, and it was disestablished, disestablished, under the influence very much of Thomas Jefferson, uh, who uh, was, the, was one of the people, along with Roger Williams, who coined that phrase, separation of church and state. Uh, so, but there was a problem. There was a problem, which is they didn't have public schools in those days. If kids were going to get educated, well, well, wealthy kids always got educated. They had tutors. Right? But if everyone else was going to get educated, before the existence of a public school system, it had to be done through the churches. Right? Um, and when, when the Episcopal Church in Virginia was no longer established, no longer was receiving a steady infusion of funds from the state of Virginia, there was real concern that, there were, that, there would, that the system of education for children would, would break down. So some members of the Virginia legislature came up with a proposal. And what's interesting about this proposal is that it's actually very similar to what goes on in many perfectly decent places in Europe. Uh, and it's a very sort of moderate proposal. You might even call it a, quote, liberal proposal. Um, and what was the proposal? The proposal was very simple. Uh, everybody would pay a tax. Everybody would pay a tax. And the tax would be used for, religious edu for education sponsored by churches. But everyone, in paying the tax, could specify which church their money should go to. Right? So unlike the old system, where it all went to, to the Episcopal Church, if you were Baptist, right, you could go to the local Baptist church. If you were Methodist, you could go to the local Methodist church. Uh, they weren't worried about Jews, because they, because they didn't really have or at least know about having Jews. Uh, they were worried about Quakers. They realized Quakers would have some trouble with this system. So they created a special, special, uh, a, a special workaround for Quakers. You know, so they had some real, th they they put in some real thought about how the various religious denominations could fit into this system. So, in some ways, a very reasonable sort of proposal. James Madison wrote a famous document saying, "No, let's not do this," and the document is the memorial and remonstrance. Uh, so what was his argument? Well, he had a whole bunch of arguments. He was a politician. He had 15, 16 arguments. I'm not going to recite most of them to you. Uh, but this is his fundamental argument. This is his fundamental argument because, because we hold it for a fundamental and undeniable truth that religion or the duty which we owe to our creator can be directed only by reason and co conviction, not by force of violence. Okay, that's number one. Um, that by itself doesn't get you where you want it to go, because that's just religious liberty. And this, this piece of legislation was all about religious liberty. You had, you, had, you had the liberty to spend your money on whichever church you wanted it to go to. Okay. So, so far, he's not quite there yet. Uh, the religion, then, of every man must be left to the conviction and conscience of every man. Okay. This right is by its nature an unalienable right, right. This is the same generation that wrote the Declaration of Independence. So they believed in these unalienable rights. 
Uh, but here's, here's the important piece. This right of religious liberty, it's a right that we can exercise against other people, but it's also a duty towards our creator. So it's a right on the one hand, it's a duty on the other, and it's the duty of every man to render to the creator such homage and such only as he believes to be acceptable to him. This duty that each of us has to wh whatever we conceive our creator to be, this duty comes before our participation in the civil state. Uh, before any man can be considered as a member of the civil society, he must be considered as a subject of the governor of the universe. In other words, when civil society gets created, religion is already there, and religion already has its own sphere, and it's simply none of the government's business to involve itself with religion. All right. So this is, again, a theological idea. It's this theological idea that we are subjects to the governor of the universe before we're subjects and, and citizens of the state. Uh, and that's, that goes along with this notion that whatever rights we have as, as religious believers, their rights when we think of our relationship to, to the government, their duties when we think of, of them as our relationship to whatever we conceive our, our creator to be, the governor of, of, of the universe. These are not simply rights to do what we like. These are rights to do what we think God demands of us. So again, a very important theological premise that freedom, that, that religious freedom grows out of religious obligation. A very old idea. Uh, goes much older than Madison, older than the, than, uh, than the remonstrance, older than Christianity. Uh, it's an idea that goes back to the Bible, right? So um, there's this remarkable wordplay that is usually missed in English translations. Uh, so the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh, right? You've all seen the movie, The Ten Commandments, right? right? So the Israelites were slaves to Pharaoh. God sends Moses to freedom. God sends these ten plagues, they eventually get freed, they cross the Red Sea, uh, the Egyptians follow, the Egyptians get drowned. Okay, now they're free. They're free people, right? So, so Jews in a couple of weeks are going to celebrate Passover, and we usually think of Passover as the feast of freedom, right? The celebration of freedom, right? Um, but here's, here's the actual text. Uh, Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said, Thus says the eternal one, the God of the Hebrews, how long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go that they may serve me. Uh, and again, the English translation doesn't do justice to the underlying wordplay. Uh, they're telling Pharaoh, let these slaves go so that they can serve me. And the Hebrew word is avadeni, which means be a slave, right? So in other words, uh, it's the same word. It means slave, it means servant, it means all sorts of things, but it's quite clear, it's quite clear that the Hebrews are freed from Egyptian bondage, and that freedom is important, uh, so that they can voluntarily then take on service to God, and it's the same word, and it's the same idea that Madison consciously or not, picks up. Okay, um, another story. This is where the Church of, Le Church of Jesus Christ of, of, of Latter-day Saints comes in. Uh, 1878, um, the Mormons, I, I shouldn't call them the Mormons, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, af after the Civil War, folks in, um, in Washington uh, noticed that there was this practice in the Utah Territory of plural marriage. And uh, they started 
they started prosecuting these folks for entering into, into, poly, into polygamous marriages. And it was, there was a sort of interesting political coalition of 19th century feminists who thought this was the oppression of women, uh, 19th century religious Christian conservatives who thought this was unchristian, and abolitionists who, after they freed the slaves, were sort of looking around for something else to do. Uh, so there was this interesting coalition of folks, and they, and they all uh, pressured the federal government, which didn't need much pressure to, to prosecute the members of the LDS church. Uh, and there were all sorts of stories about how horrible plural marriage was. Um, um, quick history, LDS is a, is, an, is a religion founded in America in 1823 by Joseph Smith. Uh, they ended up, he, it was founded in New York, they ended up getting oppressed, uh, <coughs> burnt out, killed everywhere they went. Uh, they eventually, eventually settled in Utah. Uh, and um, they uh, actually wanted to become a state of the United States as a religious commonwealth uh, called Deseret. In 1852, they publicly acknowledged the, the doctrine of, of polygamy. There were actually some, uh, some military encounters with, with federal forces. Um, Non-Mormons start settling in, in Utah. Uh, by the 1870s, you had this increase in activism, and then comes this case, right? So they're claiming a free exercise right, and the court says no. And why does the court not say no? The court talks about marriage. It says marriage, while from its very nature a sacred obligation, is nevertheless also a civil contract. It's regulated by law. We're going to come back to this idea of marriage being both civil and religious. Uh, society is built on marriage, right? Society is built on marriage, that's why marriage is so important, and that's why the regulation of marriage is so important. That's what the court says. So it can't just be left to individuals to decide what form of marriage they're gonna have, because marriage is a crucial social institution, uh, and they come up with a sort of sociological theory that polygamous marriages end up being patriarchal and tyrannical. Uh, and then the court in Reynolds says what is really crucial, which is to allow this right would be to, would be to allow the professed doctrines of religious belief to be superior to the law of the land, to permit every citizen to become a law unto himself. Uh, I suspect Madison would have said, no, it's not every citizen becoming a law unto himself. Uh, it's every citizen answering to the creator as that citizen understands the demands of the creator. But in 1878, the Supreme Court said, no, we can't allow every person to become a citizen unto himself. The subtext, though, is that this wasn't just any religious group that was claiming religious rights. This was a group that had settled in a part of the country and was in, a, in, in reality governing itself, right? This was, this was not just a religious minority, it was a, it was a religious settlement in a, a, in a part of the country that the rest of the United States wanted to assert its jurisdiction over. So this case is partly about religious liberty, but it's also about an encounter with a religious group that takes its faith so, so seriously that it just keeps moving to escape the United States. And the United States sort of keeps rushing after it, and, you know, and eventually it catches up. Right? They settle in Utah, they're not gonna go anywhere else, the United States catches up. So this is partly a fight about a specific question of religious liberty. But it's also a fight about the possibility of creating that sort of community. Now, other groups have managed to create insular communities. You know, think of the Amish, for example. Uh, but the LDS church sort of had this in-your-face aggressive quality that made it almost inevitable that they would end up losing whatever conflict there was. Uh, and 
Eventually, the LDS church gave up polygamy. Uh, and it was only then that Utah could become a state. So the, the, the flag of Utah, one of my hobbies is thinking about flags. The flag of Utah is this sort of wonderful statement that uh, refers back to the original history in 1847 uh, of, of the beehive, which is which was the symbol of Deseret, right? The, the, the sort of industriousness of these early LDS settlers. And it also totally, totally embraces American identity, right? Not one, not one US flag, two US flags, plus an American eagle on the state flag, right? So there was this transformation within the church itself. Okay, uh, next case. Uh, we're getting closer to, to, uh, to, to contemporary times. Uh, this was technically not a religion case, it was technically a free speech case, but it was American encounter with a group whose notion of national identity was very different than that of the majority, and that was the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses have figured in lots of these free exercise cases because of a couple of reasons. One is they proselytize, sometimes loudly, right? Uh, sometimes in ways that, look, that localities try to regulate. Uh, and they've also figured in a lot of these free exercise cases and a lot of religious liberty and free speech cases because they insist on maintaining, for religious reasons, maintaining a certain distance from the usual symbols of American identity. Uh, and Barnett itself, these are the two girls who were involved, they were school girls, and they refused to say the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, not because of any mention of God, in fact, there was no mention of God in the original Pledge of Allegiance, that was added later. Uh, they refused to say it because they said, we can only pledge allegiance to God, right? Uh, so unlike Madison, who said you can pledge allegiance to both, just separately, as long as they're kept divided, uh, from the point of view of Jehovah's Witnesses, they could not pledge allegiance to the flag. And the judge, and by the way, uh, were, were, were any of you in school when this was the Pledge of Allegiance? I mean, when this was the, this was the 30s, right? this was the 30s into the 40s, uh, into the 40s. Um, the way the Pledge of Allegiance used to be said was, I pledge allegiance, uh, if, 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 right. I pledge, no, 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 it was, it was, it was, it was, it was palm up. Palm up. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, uh, and then eventually in some, I've seen films both ways, in some the palm stays up, in others it eventually go, goes to the heart. Uh, it's hard, it's hard to imagine that the Supreme Court is not influenced by the uncanny resemblance between that <laughs> This is, this is the 1940s, right? The middle of the Second World War. Who are we fighting? Uh, some people quibbled about the fact that it was palm up rather than palm down, but still. So the Supreme Court has, uh, recognized the right of the, of the Jehovah's Witnesses not to participate in the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, and two things here, two things. One is Robert Jackson, majority opinion, has this very sort of eloquent view of it. If there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official high or petty can prescribe which shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, right? So we can have religious orthodoxy, but not political orthodoxy. He's distinguishing between politics and religion. There was another problem, there was a problem though. Um, what, what, Felix Frankfurter said in dissent is, we're not asking these kids, uh, we're not forbidding these kids from saying what they want. We're simply requiring them to participate in this ceremony. And Frankfurter said, there's no constitutional right not to say something that you're required to say. There's only a constitutional right to say what you do want to say. Right? So, so Frankfurter's argument, right, Frankfurter's argument was they can make clear to the teacher that they're saying this under protest. 
they have a First Amendment right to do that, but they still have to, ha but the school can still force them to say the pledge. Um, now, if you think that's a silly argument, it's th th there was a similar debate in Masterpiece Cake Shop, right? There are people who say, um, right, so, so the baker in Masterpiece Cake Shop says, I shouldn't be forced to, to produce this cake. And the opponents say, as long as you have the right on, to, to say, I object to the cake that I'm making, that's, that's the only right you have. So we can force you to make the cake. What we cannot do is forbid you from expressing opposition. Not all that different. Not all that different. So that was Frankfurter's view. And Jackson does something interesting. Jackson says, silence is a form of speech. Silence is a form of speech. And how do we know that it's a form of speech? Because we know how ritual works, and including religious ritual. So he draws on the history of religious ritual as his evidence that silence can be, can be in, incredibly important and incredibly meaningful. And the right of the Jehovah's Witnesses to remain silent is a form of expression. And how do we know that? Because we know the history of how silence and symbols get used in religion. And interestingly enough, uh, he actually talks about Quakers who suffered punishment rather than uncovering their heads, right? All of these things are connected. Okay, uh, school prayer, school prayer. Why, why school prayer unconstitutional? Why school prayer unconstitutional? Um, not a terrible prayer from a sort of ecumenical point of view. This was the prayer that was struck down in the case of Engel v. Vitale in the early 60s. Right? Uh, there were different prayers in different states. This was the prayer in New York. Almighty God, we, we acknowledge our dependence upon thee. We beg thy blessings upon us, our parents, our teachers, and our, and our country. Most religious people of most religions uh, would not find it incredibly uh, objectionable. Right? Or at least, so there was at least some effort. There was at least some effort to make the prayer as multi-denominational as possible. Obviously, not everyone could say this prayer comfortably. Uh, but remember, the people who didn't, it was clear from way back in Barnett that anyone who wanted to sit the prayer out had a constitutional right to do so. So the question in, in Engel v. Vitali was not whether people had a right to sit out the prayer. The question was whether the prayer itself was constitutional. Whether the school, not whether the school could force a kid to say the prayer, that was decided way back when. The question in Engel was whether the school could have an official prayer. And the Supreme Court said no. Supreme Court said no. Uh, and why did it say no? Uh, well, think of the arguments that, that were made. There's an interesting combination of arguments. The lead plaintiff was the father of a public school student. He was a reformed Jew, devout reformed Jew. And he had two objections, two objections. Um, one objection goes straight back to Madison. And it's this notion that it's none of the state's business to involve itself in prayer. And when you do involve yourself in prayer, you necessarily trivialize it. Yeah. Right? That was one objection. The other objection was that as a Jew, even though this prayer seemed inoffensive, as a Jew, it wasn't how Jews pray. pray. So it is two very different arguments. One was that the prayer meant too much. The other was that the prayer meant too little. Uh, and um, it was this notion that the prayer meant too little that led to objections from people that you wouldn't think would necessarily object when the prayer was introduced. Christian Century Magazine said, it's a formality. It's a formality. It's not, it's not, it's not going to help. It's not going to help kids be religious or think religiously. It's a formality. Um, I love this. Uh, in a different case, in a different case, Ellery Shep said, right? Her point, her point, by the way, was not that praying was like peeing. That was not her point. Her point was that praying as part of a school ritual, right? As part of a public school ritual. 
was a meaningless act. Right? This, was not a, this was not a statement against praying. It was a statement against praying under the sponsorship of the school. And the su Supreme Court agreed. And the Supreme Court, in, a, in an opinion by Justice Black, said um, that a union of government and religion, and this is important because this emphasizes the theological piece of it, it tends to destroy government and to degrade religion. We have separation of church and state partly to protect the government from religion. Some people emphasize that. We also have an establishment clause to protect religion from government. And how do we protect religion from government? By avoiding these sorts of situations in which, religious get, in, in which religion gets co-opted, religion gets used, religion gets sort of drafted. You know, so think of it, you have the prayer and you have the Pledge of Allegiance as, as part of the same ritual. Right? So religion is getting co-opted into this patriotic exercise. So, so Black said it tends to destroy government and to degrade religion. And religion, and again this goes back to the founders, and it goes back before the founders, religion is too personal, too sacred, too holy to permit its, its unhallowed perversion by a civil magistrate. Uh, this prayer, in, in Justice Black's view, was unholy. It's not just that it was unconstitutional, it was unholy. And that just builds on this theme that I've been emphasizing all night, that there's a theological piece to our convictions about church and state. It is neither sacrilegious nor anti-religious to say that each country, that each separate government should stay out of the business of writing official prayers. Uh, and according to his biographer, when Justice Black announced this opinion, that's when his voice trembled, when he said that religion was too personal, too sacred, too holy. That's when he sort of dropped his lawyer guys and his voice trembled. Uh, Justice Black was from Alabama originally. He had been a senator. Uh, he had been raised in a very religious household. He himself had a complicated relationship to religion personally, but he still had lots of, uh, lots of family and friends back in Alabama who were not happy with this opinion. And they wrote him letters, you know, his own family, his own friends, they wrote him letters saying, how could you do this? How could you do this? In responding to them, he didn't quote the Establishment Clause, didn't quote the Constitution, didn't quote James Madison. What do you suppose he quoted in responding to his family and friends? Yeah, he quoted the New Testament. And, he's, and he didn't even have to quote it because they knew it by heart. He said, read the sixth chapter of Matthew 1 to 19, particularly verses 5 through 8. <laughs> right? Then you'll understand. Then you'll understand. Uh, so if you're not an expert, if you haven't gotten the New Testament memorized, uh, this is what Jesus said. Right? When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites. Uh, when you pray, go to your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. It's obviously not taken literally by, by most Christians. Uh, but it was just as Black's way of convincing his fellow Alabamians that he actually had their religious interests at heart. Okay, a little bit more on marriage. Uh, and this is gonna be my last story, but it has two cases. One is an old case, uh, fascinating case it's in its own rise. I could spend hours on this case called Dalrymple v. Uh, v. Dalrymple back in London in 1811. It's a really interesting case too. Uh, this jerk, uh, John William Henry Dalrymple, the seventh Earl of Stair, when he, he had come from a Scottish noble family, he was living in England. When he was a young man, he was in the military, he was stationed in Edinburgh, and he um, had a relationship with this woman called Joanna Gordon. And he kept writing her letters saying, as far as I'm concerned, we're married, right? You've heard that story, right? You've heard that. As far as I'm concerned, we're married. Um, when his 
when, when, his, uh, when his stint is over, he goes back to London, and of course he forgets all about Joanna, right? Uh, and he ends up marrying somebody of slightly higher rank, uh, commensurate with his, with his prestige and his social standing. So he marries later Laura Manners uh, at Tolomach, and they have a real life ceremonial marriage in 1808. Unlike most women in that sort of situation, though, Joanna does not take this line down. Joanna sues the bastard. Um, <laughs> And she sues him in London in the consistory court, and she wins. She wins. The second marriage is invalid. Uh, the first marriage is, even though it's a non-ceremonial marriage, uh, Lord Stowell, the judge, says that English law requires a ceremonial marriage. Scottish law doesn't. Uh, anyone ever see Brigadoon? Right? There's that wonderful s scene in Brigadoon, right? where there's a marriage, and there's no, there's, n there's no minister. And the head of the town gets up, and, he's, and he says, uh, you know, there's no minister here, uh, but under the ancient law of Scotland, and he, and he doesn't realize it, but he's quoting Judge Stowell, uh, under the ancient law of Scotland, any two people who uh, exchange expressions of intent are married. Uh, so that was the law of Scotland. But the interesting thing about this opinion is this account of marriage. Uh, and Stoll, Lord Stowell says marriage is a contract of natural law. It may exist between two individuals of different sexes. He wasn't talking about same-sex marriage. It wasn't even in his head right, in 1808. So he was just assuming two, diff two people of different sexes. Um, it is the parent, not the child of civil society very similar in some ways to, to what the court said in Reynolds. Marriage is this fundamental social institution. And he said in civil society, it becomes a civil contract. But it is also a religious institution. So it is a great mistake to suppose that because it's the one, it's, it can't be the other. So in other words, marriage, in his view, was this complicated combination of natural, civil, and religious. And you can't reduce it to one or the other. And the dimensions of each in this institution of, of marriage. Okay. Flash forward, the same-sex marriage debate. Um, the right to same-sex marriage, when it was being argued in the lower courts, was often argued on, on the supposition um, that there was simply no rational reasons, no rational reasons for excluding same-sex couples from marriage. Uh, was simply irrational, simply just, there was just no reason whatsoever. You couldn't even think of a good reason. Uh, when it got to the Supreme Court of, and therefore, because you couldn't think of a good reason, you didn't have to say very much about marriage itself. Because if there's no good reason for something, it's unconstitutional, right? If it's just so totally irrational that it's unconstitutional. When it got to the Supreme Court, Justice Kennedy, in holding for a right to same-sex marriage, had this remarkable opinion. Lots of law professors hate it because they think it's squishy and wishy, you know, sort of squishy and unanalytic. I think it's a beautiful opinion. Uh, I think it's a wonderful opinion because he takes marriage seriously. He takes the religious piece of it seriously, and he still says that because of that, there's a right to same-sex marriage, not, not, not despite that, because of that. Uh, and in fact, there are pieces of this opinion uh, that people have started incorporating into their marriage ceremonies. Uh, it's the only Supreme Court opinion I know. <laughs> Um, where there, there, there's language from the opinion that some people have incorporated into their marriage ceremony. Uh, so this is the case of Obergefell v. Hodges, 2015. Uh, there were several couples involved. Uh, one of them was a fairly, you know, was a tragic case because these folks, uh, Obergefell and Hodges, got married um, as one of them was dying. Uh, and so the issue before the Supreme Court, 
was not was whether the marriage was valid in a way that would make the other one uh, uh, the heir to 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 the one who had died. Uh, they got married on a hospital plane as one of them was being taken for uh, for treatment. Uh, and here's Justice Kennedy. Here's Justice Kennedy. He begins by talking about how important marriage is. Uh, marriage is sacred to those who live by their religions and offers unique fulfillment to those who find meaning in the secular realm. Uh, it promises nobility and dignity to all persons. Uh, it allows two people to find a life that cannot be found alone because marriage is more than just two people getting together. It's, it's greater than the sum of its parts. Uh, and it's existed across millennia, across civilizations. Uh, one of the fascinating pieces of the story of marriage is uh, if, when anthropologists look at cultures around the world, there are relatively few so-called cultural universals. There are relatively few institutions that are found in virtually every human society. Right? Uh, you know, think of, you know, think of not every human society as government, not as we know it. Not every human society has capitalism. Not every human society has this or that or the other thing. Virtually every human society uh, has marriage. And I say virtually because there's one exception. There's an ethnic group in China called the Na, which has a fascinating kinship structure of its own, which I can tell you about. They don't have marriage. Everyone else does. Right? Uh, everyone else has some form of marriage. It is this abiding uh, universal. And it is, as Lord Stowell said, a, a building block of society. And it transforms people. So, so, so Kennedy emphasizes the, the importance of marriage. Uh, and it's described, he says, in religious and philosophical texts. Uh, and he says these people uh, aren't, don't want to denigrate marriage. They want to live their lives according to it. Uh, for, for a while, and people sort of forget this, for a while there were folks in the LGBTQ world who either did not think that same-sex marriage was a very important thing to fight for, uh, or they were actively opposed to it. Because what they said was, gay culture is special. Gay culture is different. We don't need the marriage. The same-sex marriage movement was in many ways very conservative, very conservative. And Kennedy picks up on that. These people are buying into this institution. They're not denigrating it. Uh, and because it's so important, it has to be available to everyone. That's the crux of the opinion. It's not that anyone can marry whoever you love. You know, people sometimes say that, that you have a right to marry anyone who you love. You don't have a right to marry anyone you love, right? Uh, if you really, really love your sibling, still can't get married, right? Uh, I mean, if you really love your sibling that way, right, you still can't get married. There are lots of people you're not allowed to marry. Uh, and, and the laws against bigamy are still on the books and they're still constitutional. Uh, because you have a right to enter into the institution of marriage. It doesn't mean that you have a right to marry as many people as you want. Right? So there are lots of limits on marriage. But Kennedy is saying everyone has to have the opportunity to enter into that institution if that's what they want for themselves, and to enter into it without lying about who they are. Right? Uh, and that's true for all persons. So, um, and he says people who have religious objections can continue to have those religious objections. They're not irrational, they're not stupid, they're not wrong, but the Constitution has moved in a different direction. Uh, so he has this respect for religious objectors. Uh, and, then, um, and then this is the part that some people put in their, into their marriage ceremony. Right? No union is more profound than marriage and embodies the highest ideas of love, fidelity, devotion, sacrifice, and family. In forming a marital union, two people become something greater than they once were. 
As some of the petitioners in these cases demonstrate marriage and bodies of love that may endure even past death. Uh, so you can see why some people find this deeply moving and not just as a legal holding. Uh, these people who, who he's, he's declaring this right for aren't disrespecting the idea of marriage. They simply ask for equal dignity in the eyes of the law. Uh, so it's a deeply, I, it's not a religious opinion, but it's, it's an opinion that's imbued with a certain respect for the religious heritage of marriage. And that respect becomes part of the grounding for why marriage is so important, which is part of the grounding for why it has to be a right that everyone can, can exercise. Uh, so again, not to get political, but simply as to sort of state a sort of interesting little bit of sociological fact. Uh, there's at least a tiny chance, who, you know, who knows how big, between now and the election, there's at least a tiny, tiny chance uh, that our next president uh, is going to be gay. Uh, and not just gay, but someone who's in a same-sex marriage. Uh, hmm? Someone who's in a same-sex marriage, right? Uh, why do you know who I'm talking about? Why do you know who I'm talking about? And What's remarkable about that marriage, and, and what's remarkable about him, is that in some ways he expresses everything that Kennedy was talking about. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is Pete Buttigieg, if I'm pronouncing no, no one knows him. No, what? Buttigieg. Buttigieg. I heard Buttigieg. Anyway, right, nobody, nobody really knows. Uh, um, this is right before his wedding ceremony, right before his wedding ceremony, meeting with his Episcopal priest, uh, with his husband-to-be. Uh, this is the ceremony uh, in the church um, as, as traditional and religious a ceremony as you could find. Uh, this is them after the ceremony, and this is them. Uh, uh, he's the one on the left. He's the one on the left. So. There's at least a tiny chance he'll be your next president. Um, so, so that's been that's been my set of stories. Uh, and if uh, I, I'm going to leave up this up here, if anyone's interested, I have my email addresses. If you have anything you want to say, uh, and my website, and that bottom that that bottom uh, site that bottom web address uh, would would take you to a list of of articles of mine that you can download on a, on a whole bunch of subjects. Okay. Sure, thanks. Oh, we have, we have time for maybe one question. So I'll, I'll take the question. Well, well, we'll take two. There's a forward phrase, in God we trust. <laughs> US currency. And the reason I thought of it was when they first began to issue the presidential series of metal dollars. Right. The first four or five, they left it off. <laughs> and Congress was talking about godless money. All right, so. Um <laughs> so everyone has always really struggled with, in God we trust, uh, on our coins. Mm -hmm. And on and our money, and and under God and the Pledge of Allegiance, uh, uh, under God in the, in the Pledge of Allegiance was added in the, in the, in the 1950s, uh, because people were saying um, the Soviets could say our Pledge of Allegiance. All they'd have to do is substitute Union of Soviet Socialist Republics for United States. We need something that's going to distinguish us. So what distinguishes us? They're atheists. We're not. So so they put under God in the in in the Pledge of Allegiance. So, so I clerked for Justice Brennan, who was very much a, a strict separationist, uh, who, for example, dissented in the opinion when the Supreme Court upheld prayer in, in legislatures. Uh, and basically, his view of In God We Trust is, well, you, uh, well his real view was it's not worth fighting about.
his official view was that it's such a general statement. It's such a general statement. And it's not a ceremony. It's simply a set of words that it has really lost its religious significance. I'm not convinced by that. Uh, but that was, certainly, that was certainly the view that he was willing to put on paper. Uh, and there, there was a question in some of these establishment clause cases. Um, because the argument I've been making, the argument I've been making is that the establishment clause is, is at, least, at least partly designed to protect religion and to prevent the degradation of religion. That it, that it, the way I sometimes put it is that we have a secular government so that we can have a religious society. Uh, but clearly, in the days of the culture wars, not everyone is convinced by that. And at some point, and this is a purely sort of practical response, there's no principle I can really assert, uh, at some point you have to know when to pick your fights. Right? At some point you have to know when to pick your fights, and you have to realize that there are people who are just not going to buy anything that I said tonight. Not just about same-sex marriage, right? There are people who are not going to buy any of it because they say, unless you have God in public life, you are turning against God. And to have any sort of decent conversation, uh, you have to, on the one hand, be able to say with conviction that our notion of separation is, as Justice Black said, is not anti-religious. You have to believe that, and I do, that it's not anti-religious. You also have to recognize that some people will disagree, and you have to know when to pick your fights. So uh, I'm not going to die on the hill of in God we trust. We find the... Uh about same-sex marriage, uh, uh, I remember asking a discussion years ago with a, uh, uh, a colleague who was a religious uh, Catholic, and and basically said, "Yeah, this is his opinion, not mine by any means." Right. But he brought up the argument, which I can see there is something to it, that uh, once uh, gay marriage is accepted, that that it, it's a slippery slope. I, I mean, uh, how can the courts now really argue against? Uh, Right. Uh, okay. So right. On. So that's one. That's one reason that I actually think that Kennedy's opinion is so well done. And again, this is a minority view. Most law professors hate Kennedy's opinion. But one reason that I think Kennedy's opinion is so well done is that he implicitly, at least, gives us an answer to that question, uh, the slippery slope question. Um, because what he doesn't argue, right, what he doesn't argue is that marriage, you know, some people have argued marriage is just a license, it's just a contract, and any two people, uh, there was actually a case in England about two sisters uh, who wanted to marry, well, they wanted to enter into the equivalent of marriage. Not be, they were in their 80s or 90s, so they had no sexual interest. Uh, they wanted to do that because they lived in the same house and under the estate taxes, um, if they were married, the survivor could get the house without having to pay estate taxes. If they were just sisters living together, the, st the surviving sister would have to move because the estate tax would be so high that you'd have to sell the house. So that's why they wanted to get married. Um, and some people say, you know, that's fine. You know, marriage is just a relationship between any two people. It's a legal relationship. Or two people, three people, ten people, right? So Kennedy says I'm, that he's buying into this traditional notion of marriage as a, a deeply meaningful union between people that is a sort of basic building block of society. It's a fundamental building block of society. Uh, it's no coincidence that, that every society has marriage. And it's no coincidence that, that marriage is generally understood as, as heterosexual, 
right? Because, and your Catholic friend would, would probably insist on this, right? Why, you know, why do we have marriage in the first place, right? Because when, when men and women have sex, there's at least a decent chance they'll have a baby, and we need this institution that's going to bind them to each other and to the child, right? And that's go also going to try to keep them from having too much, at least too much sex outside of that institution, right? So that's, that's why marriage exists in, in, in every society. So all that Kennedy is saying is something very simple. He's not denying any of that. He's not denying that marriage is this fundamental building block in the reproduction of society. What he's saying is that marriage has become so important, so sacred, so valuable, that we're not going to cut off the possibility of marriage to same-sex couples. It's a, and the reason the slippery slope argument fails is that it's really only same-sex couples who would be cut off from the possibility of marriage, right? Anybody else further down on the slippery slope can still get married under current law. They just not, they might not be able to get married the way they want to get married, right? The person who really, really wants to have four husbands, you know, a tough luck, right? But but that that person is not cut off from the possibility of marriage. So the way that Kennedy deals with the slippery slope argument is by writing this opinion that very much takes seriously uh, the traditional account of marriage and its importance and just says, look, it's so important that the Constitution cannot tolerate this group, having this group of people who are excluded from it. And um, the, problem with, the problem with slippery slope arguments is that if you can figure out a way to draw the appropriate line, they fail, right? Uh, uh, way back when, in, in, in the early 19th century, John Marshall uh, was worrying about whether states could tax federal instrumentalities. Nothing to do with anything we're discussing tonight. But uh, Chief Justice Marshall said, the power to tax is the power to destroy. So if we allow even a little, the power to tax is the power to destroy. If, we're not, if we allow even a little tax, they can just destroy the federal government. You know, the, the, the states could tax the federal government out of existence. 100 years later, Alvo, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes comes along and he says the power to tax is not the power to destroy, not while this court sits. Right? As long as we can draw appropriate lines the slippery slope argument doesn't real, shouldn't really frighten us. What happened to the two sisters? <laughs> oh, oh, they lost. They lost. Yeah. I mean, I mean, this was a few years ago. For all I know, I wished them a long life, uh, but I haven't checked. And for all I know, uh, one of them has died. And for all I know, both of them have died. I mean, they they, they were, uh, but. But they were very clear. They only wanted to get into this relationship, this legal relationship, for you know, for tax reasons. They had, you know, this was not any, you know, and that's not what marriage is designed for, right? That's not. We have one more question over here. Yeah. Why is the government? I understand civil society. Shh. You were mentioning. Wait, 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 wait. I'm uh, loud. Uh, Unconstitutional in public schools, right. but in legislative bodies, it was ruled that it is constitutional. Could you explain a little <laughs> reasoning on that one? Well, since I drafted the dissent for Justice <laughs> well, Brennan, uh, I, I'm not going to justify that holding. Uh, the original holding uh, was essentially uh, based on historic practice. The argument was that the first Congress of the United States, the same Congress that wrote the First Amendment had a chaplain, right? And therefore, it's constitutional. Not because there's any great principle, but because of 
that, that, that practice. Uh, one thing we said in the dissent, one thing we said in the dissent was, um, we know that politicians can say one thing one day and act a different way the next day. And there's no reason to imagine that they thought that what they were doing was constitutional. Right? And even if they did think that what they were doing was constitutional, um, it's up to the court to try to figure out a sensible meaning for the Establishment Clause where all the cases fit together. And, if you, and you're absolutely right. What, you know, we, have a, we have an Establishment Clause uh, where you can't have official prayer uh, you can't have an official prayer for literal five-year-olds. Uh, you, can, you can have an official prayer for people who act like they're five-year-olds. Right? Uh, but I'm not going to try to defend it. But, but, but the rationale was history. The rationale was simply history. More recently, the court has tried to come up with a fancier rationale, but that was the original rationale. Quick question. Yeah. Both in the case of the sisters in England as well as in here, the question comes up of, I don't want to say marriage of convenience, but rather the special status, financial and various rights that, that the government gives to married couples, but not to unmarried couples. Right. Can you explain why is the government in this picture at all? Why are they deciding that some things are... I mean, if, if they didn't have that rule, if they simply said I can designate one person, to be my beneficiary without taxes or, or get these other benefits to be at my bedside, whatever all the other various rules are, would we really have that issue? I mean, yes, some gay people would certainly want to be married right. anyway, don't get me wrong, but I think, at least for the practical argument, that they're being denied some rights would go away if the government wasn't in the business of designating this special relationship at a financial and a financial relationship. Right. So. It goes back to, Lord, to what Lord Stoll was saying, right? Uh, the idea is that marriage really is this fundamental human institution, right? Uh, and Lord Stoll said it's a fundamental human institution that you could have even without government. But he says once you have government, once you have government, it's an institution that's so basic, so fundamental, that it's both appropriate and understandable that government would step in and would regulate it, and would also confer certain legal consequences for being married, uh, because it is this fundamental institution. And frankly, you know, not all married people have kids, but it's an institution that has a lot to do with family and with the continuity of the of of you know of the species. And it's also, I mean, and this goes back. This goes back at least to, uh, you know, to Cicero, right? Marriage is this little, this little commonwealth, this little government. You know, husband and you know, uh, as Cicero's idea was that, uh, in the context of the relationship of of husband and wife and children, you get practice for what it means to be a citizen in the larger world. Right? So it's this fundamental social institution. Uh, and therefore, it's a, it becomes a fundamental legal institution. And it also happens to be, for many religions, a fundamental religious institution. Uh, so some people have said the state could just, should just get out of the marriage business entirely. Uh, interestingly enough, for, for traditional Protestants, that would create real complications. Because uh, Catholics and Jews have a way religiously to marry people? Protestants don't. Uh, what looks like a Protestant marriage ceremony is a blessing of the marriage. But the marriage itself, in the, in the Protestant theological imagination, the marriage itself is a civil institution that the minister gives religious meaning to. Right? So, so Protestants would have to rethink their whole theology if, if the state got rid of civil marriage. It's not such a simple thing. And there might well be a constitutional requirement. This is going on on a limb. Uh, 
there might well be a constitutional requirement that, that the state recognize some type of institution of marriage. Now, should it have all the, all the details that it does? No, not necessarily. But that's one of the things that makes this, this whole marriage debate paradoxical because of, there is this conservative quality, as I said, to the same-sex marriage argument because there have been people all along who've said, one of the sort of LGBT or LGBTQ arguments against same-sex marriage is that all that same-sex marriage does, this is again not my argument, but it's an argument that's been made, all that same-sex marriage does is let more people into the club, right? But it's still a club, and there's still lots of people out, outside who don't have the privileges of marriage, and who don't want them, but who also lose out, right? Who also lose out. So the more radical argument is just get rid of the whole darn thing. Uh, and that's in the, and so the same-sex marriage movement, uh, by the way, uh, just by coincidence, one of my college roommates uh, was Evan Wolfson, uh, who was one of the spearheads of the same-sex marriage movement for decades. Uh, at the time, he didn't, even, he didn't even, at the time when he was a roommate of mine in college, he wasn't out. So, you know, uh, so we, had, we had no idea, right? We had no idea. And, uh, maybe we should have, but, 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 but we had no idea. Um, uh, but I think that he would admit that there's this deep conservative strain in it. And, uh, and one of the sort of the political pieces of the story is how this more radical side of the argument was basically silenced, right? Uh, in the early days, there were lots of LGBTQ people who said, this isn't important, either this isn't important or it's actually bad. You don't hear that anymore. Right? Everyone got on the bandwagon. And that was a political achievement as much as anything else. One, one more. Same-sex marriage is spoken twice in the Bible, old and new, to be an abomination to God. Uh, I was so surprised right. that, that they have such the marriage ceremony was in a church. Right. So, uh, so without getting into uh, into Christian theology about it, I'll, I'll just say this. Same-sex same marriage is nowhere discussed in the Bible. Uh, same-sex relations are discussed. Right? Same-sex marriage, they couldn't even imagine. Right? Uh, so, so it's nowhere discussed in the Bible. Um, in, the, in the Hebrew Bible, it's true that it's one of the... Um, it's, it's sort of weird language in Hebrew because, it's, because what it says is that you, you shall not have... You shall not uh, have relations with a man as, as you do with a woman. And exactly what that means, no one has entirely figured out. And then it goes on to say it is an abomination. It is a, I is think no the Hebrew. There's no against a woman with a woman. No, no, there isn't. No, there isn't. Uh, and I think the Hebrew word is tovel. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. Um, the same word, by the way, the same word is used with respect to some of the dietary laws. Uh, Eating shrimp is an abomination. Same word, same word. So I wouldn't put too much pressure on that passage in the Hebrew Bible, uh, uh, which only discusses homosexuality you know, once or twice. Uh, the main emphasis in the Hebrew Bible, not to get political, is you know, welcoming the stranger, taking care of the poor, but, but but putting that to one side. Polygamy is okay uh, in the Bible. And, right, and polygamy is okay. Uh, and and okay. in the New Testament, the New Testament, as I understand it, Jesus never discusses uh, same-sex relations as such. Paul does, and I'm not in any way an expert on, uh, on New Testament exegesis. But there have been people who've understood the reference in Paul's epistle as not being about what we would call homosexuality, as being about a different phenomenon. Um, because the, you know, the history of homosexuality is itself incredibly complicated. What the Greeks meant by it, what the Romans meant by it, is different from what we mean by it. It's different from what the biblical authors meant by it. It's just, you know, 
So the story gets, gets awfully complicated. Uh, I will just end, right, I will just end by, um, by telling the story of an Orthodox rabbi um, who was the first, there are now more, but he was the first out or, gay Orthodox rabbi. And when he was a young man and he was sort of struggling with his feelings, um, he went to, and at the time he thought he was bisexual. Um, so, so, so he went to a rabbi in Jerusalem, uh, one of these, you know, the image of course, ultra-Orthodox, ultra which is a terrible word, but, but you know what I'm talking about. It's sort of deeply, deeply devout, very isolated, insular, ultra-Orthodox rabbi uh, in one of the communities in Jerusalem, very well respected. And this young man, struggling with his sexual feelings, who's going to be an Orthodox rabbi, goes, goes to see this, 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 this sage. And he tells him, you know, I think I'm, I'm bisexual. Uh, and he has to explain what that means. Right? Uh, and this rabbi says, well, I guess you have double the capacity to love. Oh. And this young man says, is that all you have to say? <laughs> because he was expecting either to, to, to be told it's forbidden or it's allowed, right? And, and the sage says, that's all I have to say. You know, just reach whatever conclusion you want to reach. That's all I have to say. Well, so that might be a place to end. <laughs>